To the east of Massawa in the Red Sea lie the Ethiopian Dalak Islands, the deserts in the sea as they are known. Some 128 islands make up the archipelago, and in 19, a party from the Scientific Exploration Society set out to examine this ancient area. The Dalek Islands are largely barren and fringed with coral reefs, but there are occasional creeks and mangrove swamps. Mostly they're flat as pancakes, with but a few small hills to break the skyline. As a base ship, the expedition had Perla, with inflatable dinghies, each appropriately nicknamed. Here, Solomon is landing Major Blashford Snell, the expedition leader, and a party on the northern island of Nora, to inspect the village of Sahelia, where many people were reported to be blind. Most of the simple huts were of wood, with just a few buildings of stone. But if the accommodation was primitive, the hospitality was truly traditional. As guests, we were entertained personally by Sheikh Saraj, ruler of the Dalek people for some 35 years. Out came the reed beds and, of course, the usual little teapot. An odd setting for a tea party, but such hospitality is customary in most Arab countries. As hot, sweet tea was served, the children and women looked on. Unusual, for the women keep out of sight as a rule. At such ceremonies, you often get tea, followed by coffee, or even the other way round. But certainly our party was entertained quite royally. Sitting aside in the shade were the unfortunate blind people. Their affliction probably due to trachoma. Not for nothing is the area known as the tribe of the blind. Village industries are simple, like grinding dura for bread with a rolling pin and board some 700 years old. The village baker, whom we nicknamed Joe the Bun, bakes dura bread every day. His oven, a great barrel with a dough placed deep inside and a damp sack on top to retain the heat. Another occupation for the women is plaiting reeds into matting. Whilst for the men, there's the more skilled task of shipbuilding, an ancient art using specially selected mangrove wood for the keel and ribs. Some tools, like this bow drill, are primitive, and the whole construction is held together with nails, not screws. These clinker-type boats, called sambukas, may leak a little, but they're pretty seaworthy craft. For the shallower waters in shore, the dugout canoe is much used. Some of the Sambukas have engines. One even has a diesel. And they often tow two or three small boats for pearl diving. Many of the pearl divers are of the more negroid type. Some are even blind, but they still go down to assist their friends on the sea bottom. The people are very dependent on the sea, and sardines form another industry. Caught in the north of the archipelago, they are not used as food, but dried on the beach and shipped to the mainland as fertilizer. Some are even exported to South America. On the main island of Dalek are the ruins of the once great city of Dalek Kabir, former capital of the islands. Probably dating from the 16th century, the city now looks a completely abandoned site. Yet a number of these shy people still live among the ruins. The gravestones of Dalek notables, carved with Cufic characters, may date from the 9th century. Ancient, like the circles of stones being inspected by Captain Sale, the expedition's deputy leader. All that remains of Dalek Kabir, a fascinating city which once thrived upon the slave trade and is now in the final stages of decay. Such is history. On the main island are many summerings gazelle, gleaning a sparse living off the vegetation. Not indigenous to the island, they were introduced from the mainland a long time ago. 
As they have no natural enemies on the island, and the Daleks don't shoot them, they thrive and are quite tame. Many varieties of birds are to be found. The male crab plover with its distinctive heavy beak, and another surrounded by little stints. The more commonly known oyster catcher with its red bill and white bib. The pink-backed pelican, which sometimes fishes in organized groups. And the white reef heron, which always fishes alone. The osprey, a large fish-eating hawk, which plunges into the sea and catches its prey in its talons. Out here, the osprey is numerous. On one island, at least four pairs were nesting, with up to three young in each nest. In contrast to Great Britain, where a few pairs may nest in Scotland, and are lucky if they produce just a single offspring each. On the beach, Sue Fison, the expedition's secretary and assistant diver, inspects a piece of coral. When first washed up by the sea, it's not particularly remarkable, but constant bleaching in the hot sun makes it quite beautiful. Sand crabs, quite common on the beach, emerging from their holes, they scuttle along the edge of the tide at great speeds. To the poor crab, Sue must have appeared quite frightening, especially when she decided to explore its home in the sand. But he soon set to work to clear it up, pushing out the disturbed sand and tidying his home once more. The foreshore seemed to be of pulverized coral limestone, a little slimier and muddier than the sand we know, but still very beautiful tropical beaches. For nine months of the year, the Dalek Islands are hot, but the limestone cliffs, eroded and undercut by the sea, provide useful shade, as well as ready-made changing shelters if, like Sue, you want to explore the translucent waters. Beneath the surface of the sea lies a most fascinating world, the marine life of Dalak. Breaking the barrier between air and sea is like entering an enchanted world, a world of strange contours and marvelous colors with millions of fish swimming amongst the coral growths. Though some predators lurk beneath the surface, sharks, barracuda and moray, the expedition saw very few, and luckily had no trouble with them, for there were so many other species to be studied. Boxfish, stonefish, which are quite dangerous, pufferfish and parrotfish. Like an underwater cathedral, the coral arches up providing a home for most of the fish you see. In the background, of course, larger fish may be lurking. Their presence often shown by the movement of the shoals of smaller fish. When they suddenly dart away, danger is near. That's a puffer fish, a small chap really, but he can swell himself up like a football when frightened, his personal form of protection. Like most of the other fish, they live under the coral shelves, feeding on the many small growths always found around coral. In fact, the coral reef is their life, their livelihood and their safeguard. When danger threatens, they seek shelter and protection by diving into its depths. Such a lump of coral is honeycombed with numerous holes all the way through, providing homes for thousands of tiny creatures. These natural growths can take thousands of years to build up their beautiful shapes. This is table coral, lying flat like a table and supported by narrow stems of coral growing up from the reef. Stag coral, because it resembles the antlers of a stag.
Brain coral, named for obvious reasons. The coral-eating starfish, or crown of thorns as it is known. Scientists are carefully tracking the spread of this beast, which is already doing widespread damage throughout the world. Not only fish, but shells are to be found in abundance. Some are very beautiful indeed. The cowrie shell, very common in Dalek, and once used as money, is still a form of currency in other parts of the world. The giant clam, also found in profusion around the reefs, does not grow to a size that would cause it to endanger swimmers. When it tightens its grip and the great lips close, the colour of the fleshy mucus on the outside changes. Just as there are no clams of great size, nor are there any octopus in the Red Sea, yet there is much small and wonderful life to be found under the water. Such as these single cell creatures, one of the most basic forms of marine life. Joined in a string, they may look rather like fish eggs, but in fact, each is a single cell living being, almost breathtaking in their beauty of shape and movement. One of the strangest partnerships underwater is the cooperation of the goby fish and the shrimps. The goby is the breadwinner for the whole family. The shrimps stay at home to keep the hole in which they all live clean and free of sand. One of the many examples of a form of family life that exists underwater. One creature to avoid is the lionfish. Touch it and you risk a very nasty poisonous sting. Particularly beautiful and quite harmless are the angelfish, while the cephalone, when seen from the surface, always tend to look like sharks. They're about three feet long, and the tail sticking out above the water gives an impression of a shark's fin. A ripple on the surface may herald the enormous manta ray, which frequents the Dalak area in the winter months. Though it feeds only on plankton, the great ray grows up to 20 feet in span and can weigh over a tonne. On either side of its head are flexible horns used to direct water through the mouth for the sifting of plankton. Often it's accompanied by scavengers, pilot fish with suckers on their backs. They stick to the ray wherever it goes, feeding off the remains of its food supply. Though its size is enormous, this one is a 12 or 14 footer. In fact, the manta ray is completely harmless and very graceful. Unfortunately, they do have the misguided habit of cleaning the inside of their mouths by rubbing their jaws on anchor chains. At night, this tends to alarm sailors and has earned them the name Devilfish. Despite their size, they can in fact spring clear out of the water, a happy little habit they indulge in during the mating season. Other large but non-living things exist beneath the waves. The wreck is the Urania, scuttled by the Italians to avoid capture by the British during the last war. She lies at an angle in the shallow waters of the Lagoon of Hope. Formerly a 7,000 ton Italian cruise liner and very well equipped, tourists often go there to swim underwater right into the staterooms and even into the ship's swimming pool. Rather an eerie experience, for now it's inhabited only by fish. It's tragic to see a once graceful ship lying on the seabed slowly rotting away. There were reported to be other ships lying nearby several German freighters and even a U-boat, but we didn't succeed in finding them. The Urania had most of its brasswork and its propellers removed long ago. Even the name is no longer visible on its side. Exploring, of course, needs great caution, for the rusty ironwork could suddenly collapse. A fish very common in the Red Sea is the grouper, like that small one swimming away. Down in the darker depths was a great black bass, very, very old indeed. A real monster, weighing some 450 pounds. He had an unfortunate encounter with our underwater camera team, but a harpoon gun with a high explosive warhead did the trick. A little big for breakfast perhaps, but nevertheless a very fine catch indeed, and certainly a Red Sea record. 
from the large to the small. Sea urchins that move about in small packs around the wreck. You'll get a painful sting if you tread on them accidentally, but they're easy enough to avoid. All fish have territorial rights, even the little angelfish patrolling its territory of old ironwork. Happily, it swims round and round until danger threatens when it'll scuttle away deep into the wreck. So much to see, so much to explore. The beauties of the sea, the ancient civilization ashore. A people who were unfailingly hospitable, a land from which members of the expedition learned a very great deal, and about which they wondered even more.